Welcome to What the Hex, your source for Warhammer Underworlds in under 30 new releases in as many days. Today, I'm your host, Phil, and joining me, my intrepid adventurer into the Winter Maw, Skylar. How are you doing? Oh, man, I did not expect this avalanche of content to have an aftershock. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So to so if you couldn't guess, today we're going to be covering the new box set, Winter Maw, um, which is coming as a bit of a surprise. We knew it would be coming, but holy moly, is it coming? Uh, so for some context, we are recording on the 28th of March. For everyone who's been paying attention, this thing goes on pre-order on the 30th. That is uh, exactly the same day <laughs> that Zandara... Gravebreakers and the rhyme locked relics go up for sale. Ah, GW, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's uh 10 new decks in 14 days. Yeah, it's and, uh, it's wild. And we generally see eight decks in six months. I know, this is <laughs> truly insane. Um, to be fair, four of those are re-released, reworked warbands, but they will affect the meta nonetheless. So for sure, uh, it's fun. It's a fun time. We are uh, just trying to keep up. Um, I'm sure the rest of you are feeling somewhat the same. Um, so yeah, come come join us. Join it us is for exciting. this wild ride. There, yes. I mean, it. What do you? You can't complain about too many releases, right? Right. <laughs> All right, so uh, to continue with our context, we just returned from AdeptCon. Uh, it was not even a week ago, and uh, so we haven't really even had a time to come down off of that, and we haven't had any chance to do any sort of recap or anything. So as a, just a very quick community shout-out, I will just say AdeptCon was great. Thank you to everybody who came out and played, uh, both in our event and the Grand Clash, and who just said hi and hung out um big props to george for winning with his headsman um for the grand clash getting that ticket we will certainly try at least i would like to try to have a more thorough debrief but just Agreed. just to acknowledge it that is a thing uh any community shout outs that you would like to have before we dive into this brand new box yeah, uh, I'll jump off the uh, championship event that we uh, hosted. I wanted to thank you uh, for throwing that together. And uh, I'm, I'm really enthusiastic that we had 14 people out for that. And I know um, right out of the gates, we were like, I think we I think we do this again next year. Um, so uh, we're we're enthusiastic. And if you went or didn't get a chance to come and you'd like to see us uh, host a championship event at Adepticon next year, We'd like to hear from you um, because uh, we're, we're pretty, pretty dang tempted already. Um, and yeah. then outside of that, uh, on the topic of tournaments, we want to get another date in front of you right now. A save the date, if you will. Uh, our Mad Town Throwdown Q2 is going to be June 8th. So that's a Saturday. Go ahead and mark your calendars now. Event page is coming soon. We're trying to work out some finer details on the event. Uh, so stay tuned for those. Uh, at this time, the most I can tell you is it for sure will be a Nemesis event. Very good. Man, June's a long time away. Can't get here soon enough. Uh, very sweet. Any, any final community shout outs? I think otherwise we should just get right in there. Yeah, I think we I think we dive in at this point um, with uh, just coming back from Adepticon. I haven't uh, had my ear to the ground uh, to to call it, um, you know, any other special things going on in the community right now. But I know um, I know there's m much going on out there. So always stay tuned uh, to like the content feed channels on like the Vassal Discord uh, or the um, subreddit uh, Discord. Those Absolutely. Are kinda, like, two of the main gathering places on discord for for the game itself yeah um yeah and uh our other hardy adventurers can't join us today uh we have davy out on spring break and um brian is well working <laughs> yeah so uh and 
here we are. <laughs> and and I am uh, I'm fighting off the the con crud. I I got a cold at Adepticon, so uh, apologies if I have any sort of uh, odd sounding stuff or whatever. I I'm doing my best here. But yeah, some uh, some major whiplash. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, wait, we have uh, five days total from yeah. we get back uh, from we... Adepticon. Um, um, what? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> hmm. So you know, just a core box, no big deal. No big deal. Um, well, <clears throat> speaking of said core box, I, I think we've beat around the bush enough at this point. Let's let's get right in there. Um. As we usually like to do with core box releases, we've got we've got some major things that t- tend to happen with core boxes. So it's sort of twofold. We've got <clears throat> card rotation is sort of the first piece. Second is there will usually be some sort of changes in the rule book. Uh, so first off, rotation. Um, this is this is a pretty big one. Uh, not in the sense that it's like a really huge rotation, but in that it is a paradigm shift. This will be the box where we rotate out uh, Nether Maze, which means that we are now fully into a release cycle where everything is in the Nemesis format. Everything was designed with Nemesis in mind, and all of the universal cards come from the rivals decks from core boxes or individual releases. Uh, so Skylar, what are, what are your thoughts on rotation when we lose nether maze? Yeah. So mostly excited to embrace a new normal, um, and excited to see, um, what the two main formats are going to look like then, you know, nemesis and championship here. So, uh, particularly what I've been excited about is that as I've been like dabbling in both primarily nemesis sure but when I visit revisit championship uh, I notice that most of the cards that are being taken are from nemesis decks today uh, not all because you do still have the essentials pack and nether maze has been around yet um, but it means I only have to like as I'm interacting with championship, I'm just seeing the cards from Nemesis for the most part. And that will be fully true, uh, plus the Essentials pack here soon. And so what that means is that anybody that enjoys Nemesis, like championship is just right, like right there for them. Like when you get into it, it's the same card pool that you've been interacting with. Like, in fact, you'll know and have in mind so much more of the card pool because you've been seeing it in your nemesis matchups. And you also like when you're building championship, like are still locked into picking like one deck that has a plot card and then the rest. So you've got a really like interesting choice with that plot card selection, but then you also have like a tighter pool all around to be pulling from. Um, but I, I guess in summary, what I'm trying to say is just like, it's so cool that all the time that you spend playing Nemesis actually educates you on what you could see when you're playing championship. Absolutely. Um, it's it's going to open the doors to bring the two formats a lot closer together, in my opinion. Um I think that we will see decks that look very similar to what you would expect out of Nemesis. And then sprinkled in, there'll be, you know, a handful of cards from the similarly designed uh, decks. So, for instance, something you are almost certainly going to see is that if you would normally have, say, Force of Frost as a pairing, you will probably expect to see some of Seismic Shock cards end up in the same deck because they both do the spell casting thing. So like take some of the best from column a, some of the best from column B. I now have a champs deck and it's much closer to what you would sort of expect, uh, from just a merging of two nemesis decks. Uh, so I think it'll be, it'll be cool. There'll be a lot less of the, like, wait a minute, that card exists. Like what, is, what is that weird thing that you pulled out of the depths of history or whatever? <laughs> 
Oh, I'm going to miss you, Blind Gamble. <laughs> uh, that's not even the deepest cut from our uh, championship deck. I can't even remember. Uh, Chop ran some card that I was like, I, he had to borrow it from me. And I was like, what is this? I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> remember this existed. So uh, fun stuff. Um, so to crunch some of the numbers for you folks who are uh, still thinking, well, it's still a ton of cards. Well, uh, we're going to have less than what we used to, even in the new champs going forward. Uh, we are losing 178 cards out of Nether Maze. And in initially, uh, post-rotation, we are only going to be replacing those 178 with 64 cards from these two new Universal decks, which we'll be talking about here shortly. Uh, we'll get to more ostensibly throughout the rest of this season, but that still means that in total we'll be losing around 50 total cards uh, from the champs format, even when this season is like fully matured. So champs will generally be a smaller card pool. You can't pull from all of those decks because some of them have plot cards. Like champs is just going to be quite a lot smaller. And like the design philosophy for nemesis decks means that they generally don't all go together anyway. So there's very few decks where you're going to be like, oh, there's that one card out of that deck that I would really want to pull for this thing that I'm building. Like, I, I feel like Toxic Terrors has a couple of those and maybe like Force of Frost. But like, if you're not playing Hold, you're probably not grabbing a whole lot out of like Fearsome Fortress, right? Right. And then forgoing that plot card altogether. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, it's going to be a, a really fun format to engage with, like just playing it uh, at our event. Uh, I was it, it feels like it's in a really, really good place. And Agreed. the fact that like it's going to be normalized along with like the idea of the nemesis card pool going forward is just going to, I think, continue to elevate uh, its new its new shape that yeah. it's taken. Yeah. Uh, the only other note then is that because of this rotation all of the Grand Alliance cards that had been printed are going to be gone. And Grand Alliance cards as a thing will no longer exist. No. Uh, yeah, let's pour one out for Grand Alliance cards because I thought that that was actually a really good design uh, decision from Agreed. Games Workshop. And I am a little sad that they didn't continue it. Um, uh, instructions and clear uh, keyboard short circuiting. I, uh, <laughs> was I not supposed to pour it out in front of me? Oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe it'll be something they can revisit down the line. Maybe they can have like a release where it's like, hey, here's an order uh, rivals deck and it can only be used by order war bands or whatever. And it's all universal cards. That would be cool in my opinion, but like that's a lot of cards to dedicate to something like that, but I still think it would make sense. Um, Agree. I'd like to see it eventually. I hope that the game gets to a place where that's something that can enter in. Um, from viewing like other game systems, like trickle an idea like that into place where like first you get the destruction one and then an amount of time passes, then you get the death one. I hope that that doesn't occur. I hope that like if yeah. it's going to happen... They come in one like Rivals of the Mirrored City, you know, uh, four yeah. pack box. Uh, but time will tell. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think it would be a little weird for it to be like, hey, this faction is going to have a bunch of new tools and no other Grand Alliance is going to have those. I think that would be weird. Um, so agreed. But either way, uh, of a whole new world and I am certainly looking forward to it. It'll be fun. Uh for anybody who's on the fence about trying championship, I think now is probably the time to like, just give it a go, see how it goes because uh, it's going to be a, like the most approachable it's ever been. Um, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. Our, our event was certainly a ton of fun. So uh, don't be intimidated. Here, Come here. on out, hang out. All right. We spent enough time on rotation. I think that was uh, a lot to talk about. To basically say Nether Maze is gone, which it, it has more implications. But people are here for a box. They want to know what's in the box. They want to know what's going on with the cardboard. We have a rule book uh, in this box. Usually, you are our uh, rules expert who gets to 
keenly go through and highlight all the differences, but you didn't get to do that this time. How are you feeling about that? Uh, like, uh, <laughs> like an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> It's just there's this hole in me I can't fill right now. <laughs> yeah. Is it a winter maw sized hole? It is indeed. Ah, uh, all right. It's a lovely place full of where highlighters <laughs> <laughs> could exist. Yeah. Uh, but it's been replaced instead by cuddly frost worms and parasites that just want to be my friend. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's great. It's a great place. <laughs> I think I think she go visit. Uh but our, our co-host Davey did us the solid while he was on vacation of bringing the rule book with him so that because uh, he got this box while we were deep in battle at, at AdeptCon. And so he cracked it open and uh, got us going. And uh, so he, he did the scan that you normally would do. Did he find any new changes for us? He did not. Not, <laughs> not, a not really one. Yeah. So there's been like a codification, essentially, of uh, a few ideas that we were familiar with before. And that's namely around player actions. They've been formalized as a category uh, and given names. So uh, when you would take a activation to draw a power card, that has now been codified as venture. And when you would take an activation to cycle out an objective card from your hand, draw a new one, uh, that has been formalized as strategize. And beyond that, uh, uninspire has been carved out uh, and codified kind of as its own thing. Like it, it existed in concept before and we were all familiar with it, but it, it's um, grabbed its own box. And now the same thing where like if you were to inspire an already inspired fighter, nothing happens. Same thing's now true for uninspired fighters. If you were to uninspire an already uninspired fighter, nothing happens. Yeah. Which is kind of, uh, I don't know, almost a welcome thing. Like I feel like there's been so much change in the past few rule books where it's like every single one is like, oh, here's these like, maybe not large, but significant changes to have a rule book where it's just like, we cleared up some wording. Here's some slight tweaks, but overall it's staying the same. Yeah. It's actually uh, really refreshing. It, it's nice just because it, it lets us sort of settle a little bit before the next wave of changes comes. Um, and it also means that, you know, there's not a bunch of stuff for newer people to learn right off the rip. So, uh, I appreciate that. So that's, uh, that's the rule book. I imagine having keyword adventure and strategize, it'll probably become something that can be referenced on future rules and we will see it show up on cards. But for now, it really doesn't have any bearing besides just templating and maybe it it makes the glossy the glossary easier to use. But yeah. Rule book. I like it. Uh we do not have much that we can say about the boards or the tokens or anything like that because we didn't actually get a good look at them. But from what I saw um from the videos that they showed, it looks like some of these boards are a little wild. Uh there's one that has like three snare hexes in like a triangle and then like multiple block taxes on the same board. And so I, I think we're going to be seeing some pretty busy boards. Yeah. Uh, interesting ones too with, um, man. So with, with boards, uh, as excited as I am to like play around with, uh, some new, uh, formations, right. Uh, and, and offerings from them. There are so many boards. <laughs> Like, there, there are a lot of boards, and I guess we should say the Nether Maze boards will be rotating out as well. Um, but yeah. I don't know that I ever really used the Nether Maze boards all that much. So, to your point, <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of boards to choose from. Like, if you just count the physical boards, there's what, like ten, 10 or twelve? Them. Yeah, ten. We yeah. got eight, eight core boxes and then a starter box. Yeah, but then each side. Right yeah. counts. So we've got 20 facings. At, yeah, to choose from, which is and, nuts. Yeah, it'll best of three. You only need three of those. So uh, <laughs> I I wouldn't personally be opposed to, um, 
you know, seeing seeing those get tighter, uh, where like you know you only have, I don't know, uh, the the current realm and starter kit, you know, to choose from from a board standpoint. The the downside there though is, I w- I would be sad if that was ever you know a, a reason to dissuade um, like access accessibility and you know somebody wanting to get into the game uh, yeah. is you know feeling that well at, you know at least annually i have to to re up on boards and although that's something that uh, a lot of us do you know it it definitely you know isn't uh what what everybody wants to be doing Fair. so yeah uh, and i wouldn't want to lose players based on that but uh i do i do think the board pool is just ridiculous like you just have your 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 choice at yeah. all times yeah but i i mean to that end like in in a best of three, I can still pretty easily narrow it down to be like, these are the best three for me and I'll just bring those. So yeah, it almost is, ends up as a moot point. It's almost like uh, analysis paralysis where in, until you've really sat down and looked at them all, you're just like, I don't even know which one to pick. I'll pick this one because I haven't used it yet. Um, so sort of a few different sides of the same problem there. But um, either way, uh, that's probably about all we need to say about boards. Uh, I'm sure if you want a much deeper dive into boards, you can head on over to Monkey's Paw, which is or Monkey's Hacks. Monkey's Hacks, which is uh, the blog for um, Flavius. Yes, Flavius. He does great work breaking down uh, boards, board layouts, uh, deployment strategies, objective placement. If you want anything. Uh, to that degree of detail please go go patronize him because we rarely get into that level of uh board stuff uh we probably should at some point but for right now that is not something we are doing so uh go go check him out he already does it it's awesome agreed and if you want uh any other details on the cardboard that's coming in um uh, just trying to transition uh, to the OP kit here. So perfect transition just nailed <laughs> by me, v- viewers. I'm sure you'll agree, listeners, <laughs> um, is uh, the the new organized play kit for Winter Maw. Like uh, the images have uh, come out for that. And there are move and charge tokens that are going to be acrylic now. And they look gorgeous in that frosty blue. So yeah. uh, get out to your local, uh, try to see... Uh, if there's an organized play kit available in your local, if there's not, uh, talk to your friendly local game store and see if that's something that can happen because um, there's usually eight of those packaged in the OP kits and it's really great to you know, um, be able to support uh, a local uh, with uh, stuff like that. Yeah, a uh, great incentive to try and build a new uh, play group if you don't have one already or to just reward the players who are already in your play group. Um, they're always great. I think the the play kits come with a lot of cool stuff. The alternate art cards are always great. So very much looking forward to it. Um, will be very fun. All right, Phil. Yeah. Which warband would you like to talk about first? Well, with, without having spent a lot of time with them, I think maybe we just start uh, in just in, we just go in alphabetical order here. We we start with Brethren of the Bolt. Uh, so for folks who have watched the video, these are your lightning rod bandaged up Cities of Sigmar guys. And for people who haven't watched the video, uh, I guess you now have a description of them. They uh, <laughs> so so in in essence, these guys are. Uh, they're like Sigmar uh, acolytes who are just like fanatics turned up to 11. They, they believe uh, so strongly in Sigmar that every single one of them has been hit by lightning at some point. Some of them like Sigmarite, like Stormcast lightning. Some of them just regular old lightning, but they all believe that it was from Sigmar and it was divinely inspired uh so some some pretty cool stuff going on with these guys um to give a idea of what the warband sort of looks like from a sort of number crunch situation they are a five fighter warband they um have a leader with four wounds they have 
two fighters with three wounds and two fighters with two wounds. So they are uh, sort of middle of the pack in terms of survivability. Um, but they all have this pretty interesting ability on their plot card, which essentially says that they can make attacks using friendly fighters to sort of increase the range of their attacks. Although the way that it's worded is a little confusing in that it says you subtract the number of hexes between yourself and the target equal the number of friendly fighters in that range. The reason I can think of for wording it that way, which makes it much harder to read, is that they don't actually want the attack characteristic to change. They just want the distance to count as smaller. Uh, what do you think, Skylar? Yeah, that's my take there as well. I, when I read it the first time, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> and had yeah. to like do, do a little bit of a reread and wrap my head around it. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you know, for if there's somebody four hexes away from you and you've got a range three attack, uh, but between you and that target, one of your own is uh, in the middle, you can use them to extend the range uh, yeah. and, and make that range three uh, go, go all the way up to four for you. Yeah. Which yep. is pretty wild. So, and I guess what it really accomplishes is um, uh, put like puts these ranges still like under their same categories going forward. So, like a range one that's extended by everybody in a line, right? Still counts as a range one attack and receives yep. those benefits scores that way. So, I got to imagine um, that you nailed it on the head there. That that's why it's worded this way. Yeah, for other rules interactions. So stuff that says like, oh, this fighter can't be targeted with a range three attack or something. They didn't want uh, a range one that's being increased because of this to be able to be turned off by you know somebody else's rule. So exactly. Some very weirdly worded sort of convoluted rules to essentially get you to the point of saying your friendly fighters can increase your range, which is pretty wild when you think about it. Like in theory... That means that your range three attacks, if you have all four of your friendly fighters in between yourself and your target, you could have all the way up to a range seven attack, right? Yeah. Wild, yeah. <laughs> wild stuff. Uh, and and so along with that, and, and it is, I think, important to start with that because it plays directly into their Inspire. They all start Inspired. And then when they make a successful attack, they'll uninspire. The idea being they are charged with this holy lightning, and when they hit somebody, it discharges. When they are used to increase the range of a friendly fighter's attack, they then become inspired again. Uh, they also have another ability, uh, just a regular inspire, to just say if they support an attack and are adjacent to the target, they'll inspire so even if they're not used as a range modifier they can also inspire so pretty wild what what are your thoughts of the fighters just and their mechanics as a whole yeah so that uh inspire box by the way i think it's going to overlap most of the time with what the plot can do to inspire Agreed. them but uh it is nice that you know your footing can be behind the target essentially and, yeah. and still uh help you get nice and inspired there but uh i am like really uh caught up in this one phil like i have been <laughs> super surprised by it I'll, I'll admit that when i first saw the models i was like i don't i don't know uh i actually thought it was a death war band at first and then i was like wait yeah, do all we have bandages. a death yeah like a death first death war band going on here but as I've learned more about this war band. They have gotten their hooks so deep in me <laughs> because uh, so if, if Brian were on, he could tell you that um, like religious cults uh, is a narrative hook for me. I mm. really like like the cult of the wall in attack on Titan um, or um, in dead space, um, the church of Altman. Like those are, I, I, for some reason, like it always narratively grabs me. So that hooks here. Then we've got this really interesting, like Rube Goldberg, like machine setup where you're like, tr like constantly trying to like push fighters into place uh, mm -hmm. so that you can like inspire and extend range and all that stuff. Like, um, 
it, it, it piqued my interest immediately before I learned anything more about them. And then the narrative hook grabbed me. And then, and this is uh, getting into spoiler territory, there's some synergies very evident with my favorite deck in the game, <laughs> Fearsome Fortress. Yeah. Uh, so uh, not just two big old meat hooks in me, but three. <laughs> and you'd think the meat hooks would be coming from Skinnerkin, but no, they've pulled me all the way in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I guess for me, uh, it's kind of the complete opposite. I, I don't, I don't think that anything about the warband from a like aesthetics or design standpoint really jumps out at me. It's like, okay, cool. We got some zappy boys and they like to zap through their friends. Like, okay. And then the models, I was just like, ugh, God, uh, the, uh, all the like weird chained up, like electrode stuff like very frankenstein-esque and then i think the thing that really just was the kicker for me is the the leader where he's riding on the shoulders of his son so he's like literally two guys in a trench coat (laughs) and i was just like i'm never gonna play this warband uh and i'm i i hold true to that after reading their cards although their mechanics seem to me like they're going to be very good uh their attack profiles seem quite solid, especially when you think about the fact that they can be having range two to three on every single attack if you line stuff up right. So um, pretty cool. Uh, I guess if I were to try and find one thing that seems like their sort of weakness, I would say it seems like they are relatively slow and they have relatively low defense. So that is probably something you'll have to shore up uh, especially because they like to hold objectives. Yeah, yeah. Health category too. We got two fighters on two health, and then two on three, and our leader on four. Yeah. Um, not a single one seen two def- two defense dice to their name. Yep. All on three move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This so, is going to be an, <laughs> um, an exercise in learning how to manage <laughs> everything just stated. Yeah. Um, to, uh, but, you know, to that point, uh, you know, we see uh, Loon Court doing pretty well right now. And they have, you know, not a ton of fighters that start uh, with more than one defense die and more than two wounds. Uh, of course, they can inspire much easier than they used to be able to. So fast. But, uh, you know, that, that still works out. R and I have a lot of uh, very squishy fighters, although their defense characteristics are better, but still lots of low wounds. So we've seen it managed. I think you can still do it here. I think so, too. Uh, should be interesting, though. It, it seems like a, a balancing act uh, by the design team to offer such like interesting range and damage outputs um you know to to make sure that like that is even keeled on the on the other side of the equation right like if you can get to these fighters um then you know and you're getting to them with the right damage characteristics you can probably really take them down yeah i think i think you're right i think it's it's just a matter of like how do you get there before they zap you um so that should be an interesting puzzle uh so that's sort of the fighters and the warband mechanics on a very high level. Um, again, if you want, you know, the deeper dive, we've done a full card by card review in our blog. We would have loved to be able to do a deeper dive here for audio, but we really just didn't have the time. Um, the turnaround was just very short. So uh, we will we will certainly circle back uh, to, I'm sure, any number of these releases. But for now... Just know uh, we're not we're not skimming over this stuff just to be teases. We're <laughs> we're just trying to save us some time. Um, but before we move to the next thing, I did think it would be fun if we could just each pull out a favorite objective and power card, or maybe yeah. of each power category. So gambit uh, and upgrade. Like that idea quite a bit. All right. Well, how about you start us off then? All right. So. Let's see. My favorite uh, objective is going to be uh, Conviction's Reward. This is a duel. Score this in an end phase if one or more enemy fighters are out of action and your warband holds two or more objectives. Mm. So 
right out of the gate. Um, I am just excited that this is a, a flex card, right? So we're, um, yep. it's not the only one in here that's carving out this flex play identity uh, for them. And it's my favorite play style. Um, but this card is one I've ran quite a bit in the name Path to Victory, but it's even better than Path to Victory uh, because that card requires you to hold two uh, in your end phase and have uh, killed an enemy fighter in the preceding action phase. So here, as long as it's happened at some point in time previously, uh, doesn't actually have to be the, the previous action phase, uh, mm. which cranks yeah. up like the value of this card. And yeah. Uh, uh, big fan. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I will pick uh, Sparking Furrer just because <laughs> this this card is a two glory surge and I feel like it's going to be in every single one of their decks. I just sat up straighter. You said uh, two glory surge. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two glory surge for those at home. Uh, your warband made one or more successful attack actions in the previous activation and two or more was subtracted from the total distance between the attacker and the target by the Holy Vessel's ability for one or more of the attacks that you made. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound that difficult. No, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> this could be, uh, this maybe is like some glory bleed assistance, right? Like, Yeah, yeah, it yeah. could be. It could yeah. be. Um, um, I'm definitely going to be trying this out uh, like for a while like yeah. it's gonna it's gonna have to prove to me <laughs> that i am very wrong before i start cutting this from decks because i a think absolutely um, yeah like i i think that this is gonna be a, a staple of theirs yeah um i think there's probably plenty of situations where just in setup you can probably line up a range three attack with your leader that would be able to ex have the extended range by two um you you do have to be careful in the sense that it does have to be like the shortest distance. You can't like count extra hexes to be able to get your fighters in there. It, it is going to say like, okay, well it's a range three attack. So any, any way that you can count three to your target, if, if you have the fighters in there, you can do it, but you do have to line that up. But with range three, like there's so many different permutations of how you can line this up. I, I, you do have to hit, but I mean, uh, yeah. I, will, I will just say three fury with cleave is a pretty accurate attack. I also think this card is going to be part of my mulligan decisions because you want to see this as early as possible. Like as soon as you oh, start yeah. lo losing fighters, this becomes harder and harder, which is why I'm like, like I wonder, you know, if eventually um, like it will tune itself out uh, of my decks, but uh, I, Maybe. I, I hope it doesn't. Uh, yeah. cause I, I think it's really, really fun to try to like lean into this early. So the only way it ends up dead is if you lose three fighters and if you are losing three of your fighters, you're probably in a bad spot anyway. So yep. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, don't need to spend any more time on it. I was just, when I first read it, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, an interesting pick. I'm glad you chose it for this. All right. Uh, gambit one, one favorite gambit here. All right. I can't not pick reverse charge. <laughs> sure. Because it is just, just chef's kiss pun level here between the idea of a reverse charge, like in the electrical sense, as well as the mechanical sense reaction, yeah. play this after a friendly fighters attack action if that fighter has no charge tokens, that fighter makes a move action. <laughs> yeah. So why don't we go ahead and spin uh, that that move attack backwards and make it attack move. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Reverse no, it's charge. Good, though. Yeah. And uh, with, um, you know, you've got a range three fighter and a range two fighter out the gate. Um, but even if you are in a bad spot with a range one fighter, you can get that attack off on, you know, and then boogie on out. Yeah. I, I like it quite a bit. I think there's there's lots of warbands that wish they had a card like that. Uh, for me, I'm going to say Bolt from the Blue, just because this is in some ways a bit of a callback to some older design. Um, so you choose a friendly fighter holding an objective and you inspire the chosen fighter. And at the end of the next turn, if that fighter is inspired, you will uninspire them. So it, it is uh, balancing in the sense that you don't just get to stay inspired as long as you want. 
um, which we used to have cards that literally just said inspire this fighter and then they're just inspired forever, which is crazy. Um, but I like the because you know you're going to have to be playing this resource game of like discharging and recharging all your fighters that having a power card that just lets you do it on demand uh, is pretty good um, and should help to smooth out some of your um, turn order. Uh, one of the things that I've always found difficult, especially now playing Domitans, is like I need to be planning so many t- activations ahead so that I make sure I end up in the right state for where I want, when I want. And a card like this just helps smooth that out. So you can just be like, I know it whenever I need it, assuming I can be on an objective, I will have an inspired fighter where I want them, which I think is very good. Agreed. Yeah, uh, I play Miari's Purifiers a lot, and they have uh, an on-demand Inspire in their deck that you can uh, fuel for, like, all game or just, you know, like, uh, take the the one round, you know, Inspire. Yeah. And uh, I can say from from firsthand, like, uh, even if you're just taking, like, in that case, it for the round, you're taking it for the activation, you need it, and it's it's going to, like, uh, do work for you. So uh, I was excited to see that here uh, just having played around with the concept, you know, a little bit um, elsewhere. Yeah. So. All right. And then uh, one upgrade that you would like to call out. So the upgrade for me is Holy Spasms. This <laughs> I is... like this one too. This is one I was thinking about. It's so good. <laughs> it's a reaction. Use this after this fighter is inspired or uninspired. Push this fighter one hex. Oh, man, that can be a lot of push. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, listen, <laughs> listeners, uh, if there's one thing we've imparted over the years, I hope it is that we love push deck. <laughs> and, well, and beyond the fact that we love it, it's just good. Word. Like even if even if it was like a pet thing for us, which it is, but like it should be for everyone because it's free movement. Yeah. Which and here is so good. It can like really change how um like tax can be carried out with yeah. all the range dynamics that you're dealing with it's really cool yeah uh there yeah there's just some pretty wild scenarios where you could be like inspire push attack so that then you discharge to push again so that you're lined up to be used to get attacked get inspired again to then push and it's just like oh man and a war band that cares about holding objectives too oh so good beautiful uh i love it you you stole probably my favorite but uh i will pick another one that i think is very interesting i will kind of have to reserve judgment until i see what happens in playtesting with it but uh it is along the same lines it's called fervent's release uh this one and i don't quite know how well it's gonna end up playing but it is a reaction that after this fighter is uninspired, heal one this fighter. I do think that there's a number of situations where this ends up working somewhat similarly to a uh, damage reduction upgrade, except that it's delayed. Um, the potential amount of healing that you could get from this, I think, is quite good. Uh, of course, you don't have a lot of fighters that can really take advantage of it because you have uh, only three that have three or more wounds. Um, but I will just sort of pair this uh, to say they there is another card in your deck that gives plus one wounds. So um, that it does allow for a slightly better target on this if you don't have your leader or uh, one of your other three wound fighters uh, who's already maybe hurt. Agree. Um But yeah, lots of healing potential there, and I think that's pretty cool. So that, I think, can do it for Brethren of the Bolt, unless you have any final thoughts. We do have a lot of other cards to get through. Yeah, let's jump into the next one. Yeah, the next warband, Skinnerkin. Uh, What a name, right? Um, Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which I have to keep reminding myself is their name, since immediately we adopted a nickname for them at, at, like... At preview at Adepticon, we yeah. saw Flesh Eater Courts up on the screen and we're learning that they're all culinary experts. And we were like, I, I, I think you mean Chef Eater Courts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they are, they are Chef's Kiss, uh, perfect, perfectly themed for the uh, Flesh Eaters. Um, 
so again, just a quick overview. Uh, so the Skinnerkin, they are essentially like with all the other flesh eater courts, they, they are these deluded, um, ghouls that they believe themselves to be members of some sort of a Royal house. They are either, you know, knightly figures or servants or, uh, squires or what have you, but they believe themselves to be, you know, chivalrous and well to do and, you know, uh, honorable and and in reality of course they are these cannibalistic monstrosities that have been transformed by this vampiric curse um and so the as as uh skylar mentioned they all believe to be part of this uh king's court as the uh kitchen staff and that they go out and uh gather meat for the larder to be able to put on these feasts for the king and that does play directly into their uh, actual faction mechanics. So the thing that they care the most about is going out and getting haunch counters. Um, why they chose haunch, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, a haunch is just a part of like a leg. Um, I feel like they could have just said flesh and it probably would have rolled off the tongue a little bit better and been a little bit less weird because I bet there's a bunch of people who are like what's a haunch but anyway so you get these haunch counters um how do they get them well it sort of depends each of the different fighters does it in a different way uh the main ways that you'll be doing it there's there's two uh fighters who your leader and then young master crutch if they land a successful attack they have a reaction uh well i should say they land a successful range one attack they will gain one haunch counter. And then they also have an ability on their weapons that says it's a crit prime cut. So if they roll a crit, they will get an additional haunch counter from that attack. Um, it is important to note that haunch counters go on you, the player, sort of like tithe counters from uh, the Ossiarch Bone Reapers, Kanan's Reapers. And so you have this stockpile of haunch counters and then you can use them to do different things, which you can see on the blog. There's a number of different things you can do with them. Um, nothing inherent on the fighter cards themselves though, which is slightly disappointing. Um, there is one additional, well, I guess I can say there are, there are two additional ways to get haunch counters outside of those two fighters. You have Flens Master Pudrig, who has a reaction that says when an adjacent enemy fighter is taken out of action, he can gain a haunch counter. Uh, this does not say that it has to be from an attack or from something he was supporting or whatever. It's just they were taken out of action, so it's fairly flexible in that sense. And then you have this big bat ghoul called the Karn Skier, and he has a really cool ability, so I guess I'll just read it in totality. It's called... Uh, grasping talons so it's a reaction after this fighter's move action so important there that happens during the middle of super actions like charges uh, you will roll one magic dice for an enemy fighter whose hex this fighter moved through so you, you can only choose one even if you moved through multiple fighters on a channel you will deal one damage to the fighter and gain a haunch counter so that's the way you can gain an additional haunch counter otherwise you can push that enemy fighter one hex, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, they have a really flexible ability, although you don't actually have any control of which mode you get. So don't like plan for one or the other too strongly because uh, it's a perfect 50-50. That's a fascinating ability, though. It I is just... really, really fascinating. Uh, it's one of the things I like the most about the Warband. I um, would say the same, for sure. Yeah, yeah it's like a, a built-in Soul Siphon, uh, like, plus from yeah. um, the Lady Harrow's Mournflight's upgrade pool. Yeah. Um, just straight built in. Yeah, uh, and I guess it's worth noting he is a move five flying fighter, so you have plenty of opportunities to use that ability. Um that is at a very high level again the warband they they inspire when you have three or more haunch counters so as soon as you hit three the entire warband is getting inspired which i think is fairly important um because your fighters stats are not that amazing you have 
four fighters with three wounds. Your leader has four. They all start on one defense die. Some of them on block. Are, or well, I guess only your leader starts on block. Everyone else starts on one dodge, which is yikes. Uh, and then a couple of them will inspire to two dodge. So, which can be pretty explosive in the defense category. Yes, it can be can be pretty good, but you have to get there first. Um, and since everything to get you uh, haunch counters does require that you get into your opponent, you are definitely going to be losing a couple fighters, I would imagine. I think so too as well. Thankfully, no two wound fighters. I think if they had any two wounds, I'd be very suspect. Um, but three in Nemesis, I feel like, especially in round one, almost always survives at least one attack. So... Obviously, Agreed. you can get pinged, but like, there's uh, there's only occasionally, you know, somebody on a team that can hit that three damage early on their own, and it's always only ever one fighter. Yeah, uh, it feels like so. Yeah, yeah. So it works out pretty nicely. Um, it does mean so. Like, if you couldn't have guessed, this is a pretty aggressive warband. Um, their whole shtick requires them making successful attacks or rolling crits in their attacks or moving across, you know, enemy fighters. So, uh, there is a lot of be in your opponent's business, be adjacent to them, be moving through them. So very, very aggressive. Um, that critical ability earning the name prime cut is just fantastic. (laughs) It is. It is very nice. It's very on the nose with the theme there. Um, so that's the fighters general mechanics. Uh, we don't want to get too far afield on these guys that I, I think they're one I'm really interested in. Although I do think out like between the two war bands, when you look at their mechanics, uh, one being like all about extended ranges and this one about being all about being right up in your face, it does feel like a bad matchup, right? Yeah, a little bit. Um, kind of feels so like they have the health to survive, like if they're not being um, targeted by um, the Bolty Bros, you know, twice in a, in a round. Yep. Uh, so it's almost like a game of um, like siege attrition where it's like, all right, we're going to, uh, you know, the brethren are going to line up and and start firing as these things come in. And then whatever survives round one uh, is it's going to get really bloody from there yeah. uh, in two and three. So I th- at least that's the you know first impression. Uh, I haven't actually gotten a chance to uh, try these two against each other yet. But um, given that, I would generally favor a side with ranged when it's, hey, you, you can range and pull back. And this other war band's like, in order to do everything they need to do, they need to get to you and land attacks. Yeah. I think, um, I think this box might see a bit of uh, skewed um, versus like out, out of the box. Yeah, straight rivals. Yeah, I agree. It is one of my concerns with the box straight uh, for like new players. Um, not not to say that people always are just like, yeah, let's just play straight out of the box. But I do think that does happen. You know, you know, get like two friends who are like, hey, let's split this box and we'll learn to play together. Um. I certainly know uh, that's what I did when I first started. I played Shadespire straight and it was just like, yep, I'm going to play Reavers. You're going to play Stormcast. Let's go. And it was just like some games where it was like, what am I doing? Why am I even trying? (laughs) Um, So hopefully uh, if if you're out there and you're learning and you're like, what's going on here? It's like, don't worry. Uh, Nemesis is your friend and you don't have to always play this matchup. Yeah. And I don't think that um, it's a completely one sided situation, but um, no, the the phrasing I'm I'm trying to impart is I I do think that brethren are favored here. Um, Agreed. uh, Uphill battle, uh, maybe for the Skinnerkin here. Yeah, I think there'll probably be games where it's like, oh, you charge in with your two damage, you know, young master crutch. He's two smash, two damage. And he's got this prime cut thing. So he's like, oh, I go in and I smack somebody and I roll a crit and I get a kill and I get two haunch counters. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, man, I'm going to be inspired here on my next activation with my whole war band. And like, you've already lost a fighter. And, you know, there may be some snowballing stuff. That's, that's my feeling is it's like maybe if, if they whiff, they're probably not doing a lot. And if they hit with crits, it's like, hey, here we go. We're off to the races. So. 
absolutely fun stuff i'm definitely looking forward to trying it out both sides um well i won't be playing with the uh brethren <laughs> but i will right. certainly look forward to playing against them um, we're, we're, we're a match made the two of us i can't wait perfect. to, to try it against. all right but let's get in some cards. Um, yeah, I'll, about, I'll take the back foot here, or yeah. rather the back haunch. The back haunch, indeed. Why, why, why don't you uh, <laughs> lead us with an objective? Yeah, I will I will lead us off. Um, so I will start with one that I'm not 100% sure is good, but is one that I think should probably get a try uh, with this warband almost always until we can sort of... S- figure out where the math lands with haunch counters so slaughterhouse uh this this is one that is an end phase for two glory and you will score this in an end phase if you have more haunch counters than there are surviving enemy fighters um so the reason that we need to sort of see how this one lays down is like if getting to say six haunch counters is uh fairly straightforward but by you know round three then uh, this could be pretty easy to score in most games. This could end up being like, as long as you've played the game, you'll score this two glory at some point. If getting to sit, you know, if getting to four haunch counters feels difficult, then all of a sudden the math changes considerably on this, right? It's like, how many, (laughs) how many enemy fighters do you have to kill to end up being able to pick up two, uh, two glory here? And that, that becomes the big math question. So, yeah, initially I, I'm pretty hot on this one though. I think that this is um, like their their tempo swing in a game. Like they'll yeah. eventually hit this, and um, I think be be on a good path from there. Yeah, my my quick napkin math of just trying to think through a round is like, okay, round in a round, you are probably going to make an attack with your leader and crutch, and assuming they haven't died yet one of them's probably going to hit. So there's one. Uh, and then between the Karn skier getting to have a 50, 50 just on a flyby. And then like Pudrig getting to do a thing. If you kill somebody next to him, like it feels like two in a round is pretty reasonable and you could easily spike to more than that. So I think if you, if you just say two per round feels reasonable, then through a game, six feels reasonable, which means ostensibly most games you should get to this by the end of round three and hopefully earlier but like it feels like it should just be scorable at some point i think so too and actually that leads me to my pick um i'm gonna pick one and then i'm gonna uh, toss another one out that i just uh, i think has some comedy to it but uh uh my, my pick here would be plated banquet and this is a duel score this in an end phase if you have five or more haunch counters and each surviving friendly fighter has one or more upgrades. And this is three points. I think this is a really great goal card. And I think that the math is good on those haunch counters. So I really like that there's a dual ask here. Like I think that if they raise the amount of haunch counters required, it would be too hard. So instead of raising the amount of haunch counters, uh, they instead add in this extra caveat that you need to be spreading your upgrades around. Um, and that gets easier and easier, you know, the later the game goes and the less fighters you have as well. Um, yeah. So uh, I think I'm a big fan of this one. Yeah. Uh, how about you throw out that other one? <laughs> yeah. So this is the reason I find this comedic, uh, I, I, I hope comes transparent here. Uh, he likes it fresh. Uh, dual score this in an M phase. If you have two or more haunch counters and one or more enemy fighters are vulnerable. And so <laughs> I'm just imagining I'm up against Skinnerkin and I have a vulnerable fighter that all of a sudden starts not receiving the re- uh, receiving attention. Um, and I'm going to think to myself, "Uh oh, they have he likes it fresh in hand. <laughs> and so the reason this card um, amuses me so is I could see a counterplay being made where you dunk your own fighter <laughs> so that they're only yeah. scoring one point instead of two and then hopefully you brick this card in their hand and they <laughs> it's a it's a fair it's a fair play i i think it's it's a, it highlights a weakness with this card if your opponent can see it coming um i think there's plenty of opportunity for this to happen leaving enemy fighters vulnerable until the end phase feels bad but i have had it just kind of organically happen in a number of games recently so 
certainly one to just test out to start with. Um, Agree. Uh, for two glory, it's it's definitely yeah. attempting to include, and I and I don't think it's bad. I just think uh, there's going to be some point <laughs> played in this game where somebody realizes this is the situation and just yeah. kills their own fighter. Absolutely, and that's, that's uh, where the comedy punches in for me, for sure. Especially uh, when, like, narratively, it's like, no, no, I won't be saved for the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, the well. Maybe maybe we'll save it for a uh, uh, flavor text quiz, but but like man, some of the flavor texts on these are some real horror-y stuff. Oh, for sure, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what would be your power pick? Yeah, so so I will I will pick an interesting one. There's a there's a number that I like, but I'll pick an interesting one just because it's it's something we haven't really. Oh man, there's there's actually another one I really want to do. But uh, I, I will stick to the one that I think is just interesting mechanically because we haven't seen it much. But it, it also plays interestingly with the objectives that we have picked because all the objectives that we called out all require you to have a certain number of haunch counters. Oh, no, you're going to pick mine. Uh, Keep going. This, this gambit also requires that you do stuff with haunch counters. And this one is called Unfit for a King. This is a gambit where you get to have two choices. You can discard four haunch counters. And if you do, you gain two spent glory. Or you can discard two haunch counters. And if you do, gain one spent glory. What a weird card. We do not have very many gambits that just say, play this, gain glory. Um, Even if it's spent, like, that is wild we are essentially putting a surge in your power deck but yeah what what no and, um and, and a surge where you you kind of have to think to yourself like so if i'm bringing that that five right for three yeah like, right um am i am i rolling in excess i imagine this game is going really well <laughs> yeah or or did i forgo that and this is kind of my game plan for for that extra haunch yeah stuff i don't know well and and that's where it gets interesting, right? Is it's like, well, uh, you know, is this like an insurance policy? Is this a full part of your game plan? How do you guarantee that like you've already reached the numbers that you need for your objectives if you're going to burn them on stuff like this? And like, I don't know, it makes for a really interesting dynamic of trying to balance and do that resource management. Um, so that's why I picked that one. I I think it just highlights some of the push and pull of this warband. Uh, how about you, Skylar? Yeah, so I got lucky. You didn't take mine. Uh, I would choose a spearing, uh, uh, sorry, aspiring artisan. And sure. so this is choose a friendly fighter. If you have no haunch counters, you can reroll each dice in the attack roll of the first attack action made by the chosen fighter in the next activation. And if you have one or more haunch counters, you can reroll one dice in the attack roll of the first attack action made by the chosen fighter and the next activation. And yes, this is a dice rerolling card. But, and, and so like, you know, uh, traditionally like good, but not interesting. But here I, I find it so interesting in this deck um, that there's the, there's the assistance with getting your first haunch counter. Like if yeah. you draw this card really early, like this can like really um, be explosive. It might even help you roll into uh, that prime cut uh, inspired ability. But like ultimately, it's here to help get the haunch game plan off the ground. Um, and if you draw it later than that, uh, or choose to use it later than that, you're still getting a reroll from it. So it's not dead. Uh, so I just really like um, the two sides of, of this coin. Yeah. I guess we can just very quickly say there's another one called the King of Hungers. It, it's basically a similar thing. Um, it adds dice to your range one attacks, but you get two if you have no haunch counters. Yeah. Um, really same cool. idea, same mechanic, basically. So very good accuracy boosts. Most helpful in the beginning of the game when you need haunch the most. So, uh, yeah, agreed. Very cool. How? Let's see. I guess I will continue to lead us off on uh, some upgrades here. Um, 
one of these was already spoiled. It's really cool. Um, I'll just call it out again, Potential Courtier. It was uh, in the actual reveal video for the Warband, so I won't call it again here, but I think it is a very cool card. Um, the one I will then use instead is a, a niche card, but I think a very good one. Uh, it's called Midden Heap Scavenger. This is a beast restricted upgrade. It says rolls of block are successes in this fighter's defense rolls. So note, it does not put you on guard, but it is sort of half of guard. You don't get the drive back protection, but you get the blocks. And um, it's cranking up that double dodge. Oh my yeah, gosh. Right. And That's then, fantastic. And then haha, it does more. It then says action. You gain a haunch counter and give this fighter a charge token. So if you really just need one more haunch counter, or if you're like in a situation where you just don't have a lot of good options for attacking, but you want to keep racking up haunch, you can just use this action and get an extra one. Um, I could see a lot of uses for that. Um, I think there's a lot of situations where if, if you just need to, uh, you know, change the math a little bit. Um, sometimes it's more reliable to just grab another token than it is to make an attack and hope you get one. Um, but yeah, really big defense boost. And and the fun thing is that it, it's restricted to beasts. And yes, you only have one beast, but there's a lot of cards that can make a fighter a beast, um, at least in Tooth and Claw. And so if you pair this, you could actually end up putting one of those cards on another fighter to say, hey, this fighter is now a beast. And then you can play this one on top of that. Absolutely. All right. I will add to the foray here, uh, Calloused Hands. Mm, so Yeah, good one. This is minus one damage to a minimum of one from attack actions that target this fighter. It's not restricted, so you're getting your choice of where this is landing. Um, and that ability is really great. Uh, and in fact, occasionally too strong. Um, but it goes on. Uh, after this fighter is dealt damage, break this card and gain one spent glory point. So I like this design just quite a bit because... Um, if it is an attack that comes in and does this damage to you, you're, you're seeing that mitigation. It's seen a one-time use gaining you a glory point. So your opponent has to think about, you know, the, the value there as they're making that attack. But, um, the, the break and glory is from any source of damage. Uh, so you could self damage to make this happen and just grab yourself a glory point. Um, or if your opponent really wants to make sure that attack lands in full uh, and they have access to some sort of like ping or, or power based damage, like they can like tee up kind of like um, where you think you're safer than you are. Uh, and all of a sudden this card breaks, uh, you take the damage from it breaking, right? If it's coming in with, um, you know, some form of damage to break it. And then, uh, uh Oh, I'm not also not going to receive damage mitigation in a moment, but, I'm getting paid for it. <laughs> it's yeah. Just, it's, it's fun all the way around. I, I, in thinking about it, it was like, well, man, they put another glory in the power deck. Like that's almost like getting another surge in your deck. Um, you know, if your opponent doesn't want you to score that upgrade glory, they're just going to have to never damage that fighter again. And like, that's horrible. Right. But handing your opponent a free surge is also horrible. Like, <laughs> uh, so I like that it gives some push and pull. I I don't want to spend a lot more time on these guys because we like I think we've already spent a good amount of time on them. And we'll we'll be coming back to them. Oh, for sure. Um, but I had done a quick count through their deck to be like. After reading everything, I was like, man, it feels like there's a lot of glory in here. Uh, and if you do get, if, if you go through and count it all up, including the power cards, it's over 20 potential glory in the rivals deck, which is wild. Like it is way more than what we've seen in many rivals decks recently. So, um, I think there is again, some, uh, like, uh, forgiveness for losing fighters in there i think they're trying to be like this is a somewhat swishy very aggressive warband we need to give them enough glory so they don't just give up five from losing all their fighters and then not have enough to compete but it's yeah. very interesting and i thought i was like oh that's probably something worth calling out <laughs> i think so too 
I, I'm pretty excited about their inclusion in the game. Like I would uh, initially, first impressions, classify them as your traditional ABC acro, right? Always be charging. For yep. those not familiar. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like they've got such a unique spin on it that uh, it still feels fresh, uh, like the meat that they're harvesting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no bad meat for the king. Well, that is the two war bands in their decks, uh, which I think are both very interesting. I think lots of people will gravitate to one side or the other in the box, but I, I am, I'm interested to see what people do with them. I'm sure people will be all about them. Un- unfortunately, there's just so many things to choose from right now. We may not even see them that much. Yeah, um, what a, what a weird period of time injecting seven warbands into the game. Like, yeah, right. Traditionally, it feels like uh, every release gets their spotlight, and you see like an influx of that new thing. But but right now, I think it'll be the first time in a long time, um, like because it's been dire chasm since we've seen a like release sprint like this uh flush and uh yeah yeah i think it, it'll it'll pull away from um you know how much spotlight you see on each each new one of these seven war bands absolutely well uh let let's just keep it rolling we got two more decks to get through here so and and uh not to spoil too much but they are not straightforward um how about the rhyme worms bite uh, just a little rhyme worm what's, let's, what's the problem let's jump in yeah so we've got we got a deck, and it's all about uh, some worms. Uh, where where would you like to start with this? Oh boy! Uh, so <laughs> um, the idea here uh, is that there are worms beneath the ice, uh, and it feels a little bit kind of like uh, Dune or even Tremors, where um, they're they're below the ice and they could emerge at any time. They're um, uh, summoned by you know the call of of battle above them there they hear the fighters around and so they might just break through the ice and uh take you down into their depths um as a nice little tasty snack <laughs> um so uh it's a very chaotic deck um, yeah so much of this deck is going to focus on um chaotic moments where dice uh, are going to dictate actually how things resolve um, and as well as focus on like uh, putting a many domains in play so uh, I'm, I'm glad to see another deck come out and uh, sit domain flush because I think that's a really interesting space that I want to continue to see explored and I don't want to see it oversaturated I, I want it to be interesting when uh, somebody is playing a domain deck if uh, the opponent uh, has packed domains of their own you know to help offset the domain tempo and you know take away the domains that are coming into play with their own um uh, yeah uh i think i think that's kind of where I'll, I'll start with this deck do you want do you want to add anything to that yeah i'll just say that well it is a very much kind of a chaotic deck and it is definitely domain focused there's five domains in here it is also i'd say very aggressive um most everything skews towards like staggering or damaging a fighter from both warbands kind of at the same time or like just having some sort of like more global type of effect rather than being like oh i'll apply this thing to your fighters it's like no this thing's happening kind of on the board um so yeah i think it's it's gonna be a little bit wild it's a little uh chaos it's a little damagey it's like yeah there's quite a bit of ping in here but um you know on first read it's like ooh, <laughs> like why <laughs> is there so much ping in here but like as you kind of digest it a bit um like these worms are hoping to digest you uh it doesn't seem like too much of that is in control which to me makes it feel like some of these games are going to be just downright explosive where uh the way these abilities end up landing based on like randomness is uh you know gonna stack up and really tear down an opponent but uh that's like that's gonna be when this deck like absolutely rips an opponent apart uh other times like those could all miss right or 
uh, and in a lot of cases, when these things do miss, they're they're hitting you, and so you're just like quickening your death and your opponent's yeah. game plan. Uh, so, I think that this is um, uh, going to be a warband that needs some feet, or not warband, sorry, but a Universal Rivals deck that's going to require some feeling out. And I think um, so. So I would I would just caution those who are like, "There's too much ping in here," uh, to uh, like. Uh, let's get some games behind us before we we jump to too many conclusions that like there there's too much like ping output from this deck because uh, I know that isn't everybody's f- favorite play style. Uh, mm-hmm. I, know, I know it's not mine. Yeah. Um, so should definitely be very interesting. Um, let's let's just blitz through here quick. Uh, favorite objective or one you want to call out. So favorite objective would be, or at least one I'm calling out, uh, is going to be never punished. Uh, so this is a two glory end phase. Score this in an end phase if there are fewer friendly fighters that have one or more wound counters. Then there are enemy fighters that have one or more wound counters. So again, there's this chaotic nature in this deck where everybody is getting wound counters. So Oprah's handing them out. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, have you been handed fewer of them? Hopefully. And if, if you have, then uh, to glory for you or if you found a way to, you know, heal past that uh, so that you have fewer currently wounded targets. Uh, an interesting um, piece of the puzzle, too, in the sense that uh, you might not want to, if you're running this deck, take a fighter out and change this math uh, and all of a sudden deny yourself to glory. Yeah. Uh, a very interesting card for warbands that can heal. Um, and we can leave it at that. Uh, for me, I'm just going to call out gone without a trace. I think it's mostly just a good card. I don't, I don't know if it's like super interesting, but I, I do like it. Um, this is a score immediately after a fighter was taken out of action by damage dealt by your warband's power card. So you have to get a kill, uh, with a power card, but if you do so with a domain, a friendly domain specifically, you'll get an additional glory point. Um, we certainly saw um, Sudden Demise be a bit of an oppressive card where it was just get a kill with a power card or a lethal hex and get two glory for it. And I was like, yay. I think this is a much more interesting take on that because it's only one glory if you get the kill with the power card. But uh if you can manufacture it where you're killing with a domain, you do get that extra glory. And I think it adds a lot of, uh, a, a interesting play where you're like, Ooh, I have to like set up these kills with domains. Yeah. Um, I like this one too. I think this is my favorite surge in here because of like the, the flexible interest that you have here. Yeah. Uh, both with, um, the two glory flex that you just described, but also if you're fine with grabbing it with that, for that one glory, um, you could take one of your own fighters out of action to get that uh, one glory. Yeah, that that's true. You could you if there was a way to do that. If you have a, a card, and and there's a number of cards in this deck that could do it. Um, uh, yeah. I guess a weird thing I hadn't even thought about until you just mentioned that though is that if, if uh, so some of these. Some of these cards are like symmetrical where it's like, oh, you do th- a thing to your opponent and then they do the same thing to another fighter. Uh, if they kill your fighter and you weren't thinking about it, uh, this could end up triggering and then you have to score it for one, right? Well, uh, surges are a may, but yeah, you could you could opt oh, yeah, uh, sure. and, into it at that point in time. And that's definitely, uh, if we're looking at the art, that's definitely what's happened here. Uh, Vex, <laughs> Vex more happily <laughs> has uh, taken the staff from one of his own. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although they Vex more would. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, let let's call out some gambits then, since we just mentioned that they have quite a few interesting ones. Uh, how about I lead us off for gambits? Um, All right. I would like <laughs> this, this is a wild card, and I I have no idea how it'll play out, but it's called Here It Comes, uh, which I assume is the the rhyme worm is coming. Uh, it says after the last power step in the next round, which makes me think you play out the domain and then it has a lingering effect until 
the whole next round has happened well it's gonna it's gonna have to survive until then like uh it won't did, did domains can i don't think they can just like set something into motion yeah but without, they don't persist because without... they're a persisting gambit so right it persists until the end oh until the end of the next round it specifically calls out how long that it persists until the end of the next round yeah. so yeah this one does have to survive quite a long time so actually pretty difficult to make it happen but if you do get there then the players roll off and the winner picks one territory so you have friendly territory enemy territory and no one's territory and you deal one damage to each fighter in that territory that's yeah. pretty wild See what we mean about chaotic ping damage? Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> it could be every fighter on the board, or it could be nobody. Like, who knows? We'll <laughs> but I, I just think it's like, that is, that is, I think, synthesizing the style of this deck to a T. So, I think so, too. Um, very much an interesting one. Uh, what do you have to pick? Yeah, so keeping in mind that there's five domains uh, in the ploy section here, uh, reemergence. Pick a friendly Rhymeworn Bites domain card. Uh, so if you're pairing this with another warband that can bring their own domain cards, uh, this is locking itself off immediately to just domain cards from uh, this selection. Um, so the domain card that you're choosing uh, must be persisting and or in your power discard pile. Uh, return that card to your hand. If you return a persisting domain card to your hand in this way, it no longer persists. So the idea to um, you know just recycle, re-see uh, a domain card here in this deck, uh, I think is uh, really cool. Uh, I think that uh, there's going to be some domains that you want to see again or that somebody was able to break and you're like, ah, oh, I didn't see the effect I needed you know, from it. Well, uh, I'm going to summon it back and we're going to do it again. Yeah. And and with, you know, objectives that care about, you know, like we said, deal damage with a gambit. Well, one way to make sure you have more damage that you can deal with gambits is by getting to replay them. So, yep. And I, I like to that it uh, like gives you a little bit of insurance. If you draw a domain ahead of when it's going to be applicable, uh, like that's OK. Like, well, uh, we don't have to hold it into the next round knowing that there's a chance that reemergence can can bring it back for you later. Yeah. Uh, very, very cool card. I think there'll be lots of good play with that. Uh, for upgrades, I am going to, well, there's one I really want to call out, but it doesn't really fit with the style of the deck, but I, I think I'm just going to call it out anyway. Uh, we've got the fancy boots of warding here. <laughs> if you didn't, I was. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that is not the actual name, but is what I will be calling them from now on. They are just the boots of warding. Uh, and it says this fighter cannot be dealt damage by power cards or lethal hexes. Uh, and the flavor text on this one is mystical footwear. Any adventurer would be proud to wear. Uh, I love this card on a lot of levels, but for people who are really upset about wizards right now, feel free to just don these boots and never have to worry about their gambit pings. Feels good. Agree. Well, the pick for me is going to go hand in hand with um, the objective that I had highlighted, and that is inured to hardship. Uh, so if you're looking for a way to shake wound counters, we have when you give this f upgrade to a fighter, heal one, that fighter. Uh, if that fighter is large, give that fighter a guard token instead. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> and then reaction at the start of a round, heal one, this fighter unless the spider is large. So, uh, you know, most of the time this is going to be doing the heal. And instead of just barring it away from large, I think it's rather interesting that they said, you know what, for large fighters, here's here's what. Uh, you can have another upgrade towards your upgrade count or whatever. Um, and just on application, you get one guard token. Uh, and that's it. That's all this is doing for you. Um, but uh, in every other situation, it's not only healing you at the time uh, of application, uh, which could help you with the math for um, the objective I highlighted, uh, named Never Punished. Uh, or, um, you know, uh, it could go a little further for you at the start of each round if you draw into it early. Yeah, this does a great job of dealing with the problem of these types of cards that they've always had, where you play it out and then it does nothing until the, like, the beginning of the next round. 
essentially this way it, it it always has an effect when you play it out and then we'll have the subsequent effects as you go through the game which is really nice um i i like that they've sort of fixed that design space I agree and well, to give the stack kind of a little bit of a send off here in the episode i i think one thing i want to say about it as well is it seems that it's accounted for um getting kills with um power cards and it's it, like from a glory standpoint i don't feel this deck has the most reliable like scoring objectives in it or even um like the the deepest in value uh there's no uh three glory in here i don't think there's any that flexes into it no um, there's not yeah and even that surge uh, that we talked about that can flex into two um you know uh that's a may so there's not any and and that probably makes it one of their more reliable staples um but there aren't any like heavy punishing cards in here um to like really crank up uh both the fact that you're you're going to be losing fighters a little more when you're up against this deck um if attacks are landing and and the ping damage is landing um so i like that offset i suppose is is what i'm yeah. getting at no i think it's a very good a very good thing to call out um all right, we got one thing left to do, and uh, it's it's also pretty complicated. So this is the Hungering Parasite deck. Uh, this is essentially a deck of a mini game, I guess I would say. Uh, so it's it's sort of past the parasite. Um, no matter past what, the parasite, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No matter oh, so what, apt. throughout the game, you are going to have this upgrade that you will have to play out, and uh, you will have an infected fighter, um, either one of yours or your opponent's. Um, I will read the plot card here in a moment. Um, and so the the sort of push and pull of this deck is that you want to control where the infected fighter is sort of at any given time, and then be able to score based on what is happening with the fighter who is infected with the parasite. There's a whole bunch of different things that it's like, do this thing with infected fighter or to infected fighter or with the upgrade and score. And so it, it, it zigs while everyone else is zagging. Your whole game plan is completely separated from what we would normally expect you to do in a game where like kills are not necessarily a main focus. Holding isn't really a main focus. It's like everything is focused on the Bane of Heroes upgrade. And then everything else is just branched off of that. So super different, super weird. Um, let me just read through the plot card here real quick, just so that folks have a good idea of how this works. <clears throat> so as normal with your plot card, you have to reveal it at the start of the game. After deploying your warband, give one friendly fighter your bane of heroes upgrade do not spend any glory points when you give the bane of heroes upgrade to a fighter when a fighter has one or more bane of heroes upgrades uh is taken out of action you break that upgrade so the bane of heroes upgrade does not survive through their death um in an inspire step if your bane of heroes upgrade is in your power discard pile give that upgrade to a friendly fighter or an enemy fighter that is adjacent to one or more friendly fighters so <clears throat> you will always have this upgrade out on somebody. And if you happen to have an adjacent friendly fighter, when you place it, you can then give it to an opposing fighter, which there are a few different things that care about your opposing fighters having the upgrade. <clears throat> so important to know sort of how it gets passed around. Um, you can pretty much always guarantee you can put it on one of your fighters, but your opponent's fighters, you have to find ways to get it out there. For the upgrade itself, says uh, this upgrade can only be used as described on it. the plot card and cannot be included in or added to any decks. It's just it exists outside the game. Fighters are staggered well within one hex of this fighter and you are within one hex of yourself. So you will also be staggered when you have this upgrade. Yikes. Uh, and then this fighter is uninspired and cannot be inspired. Double yikes. At the end of the action phase, this fighter's player chooses a fighter within one hex of this fighter, deal one damage to the chosen fighter. 
Again, you are always within one hex of yourself. So if you don't have another fighter nearby, you will have to take one damage. If there is another fighter, you could put it on them instead, but it doesn't have to be an opposing fighter. So all of that is to just be able to say, this is the basics of how this deck works. Are you keeping up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels like um, the same sort of like design um, like uh, exploration as... Void Curse Thralls in the sense that like Void Curse Thralls is like, okay, so we have this curse and we're going to spread the curse, right? And yeah. so you're spreading it across like to as many fighters as you can. Where here, the idea is what if, what if that curse uh, like could only exist on one fighter and was bouncing around, you know, between different fighters. Yeah. And uh, the fact that it gets its own dedicated card, like a 33rd card uh, that's unnumbered, uh, is is really cool and uh, the way D- av photographed this for us is he actually included it as like the th- um like the card that you see before the rest and then it goes into objectives and i hope that's the way it's packaged because immediately Agreed. we got this sense of like oh this is different right yeah. like this what is this upgrade uh, doing alone uh, apart from the rest is there 10 other upgrades you know down in the deck yeah, yes right. yes apparently there are uh, <laughs> and uh the bane of heroes looks adorable by the way oh Uh, so cute (laughs) and i want a full art version so bad oh i'm sure somebody will figure that out that that won't be a problem yeah so i mean there are so many different implications for this i don't think that it makes sense to even attempt to discuss them right now we don't really have the time or the experience to even say everything that that is imp- implied with Lies. this deck. Yeah, yeah. I think um, the one thing I'd like to highlight here is just the the last line from Bane of Heroes. Uh, at the end of the action phase, this fighter's player chooses a fighter within one hex of this fighter, deal one damage to the chosen fighter, right? And so uh, what this means is that when you're playing this deck, Bane of Heroes will be dealing three damage over the course of the game once per round, right? Yep. And so it's to whom that damage occurs that will be interesting because if the Bane of Heroes fighter is isolated, there's nobody adjacent to them, they're going to have to self-damage. Uh, and like that I just think is going to be the interesting element of, of that well, one you know damage being passed around is like, yeah. can I make sure that this is happening to an enemy fighter? Is this happening to my Bane of Heroes? Is that okay? Um, or do I need to pass this off to an adjacent friendly fighter? Um, regardless, there's three damage happening over the course of this game. Yeah, yeah. Just just from the inherent deck being played, like there's there's nothing else that has to happen. So very interesting. I think there's just so many different ways that this deck can probably be played. That like, man, it is it is a a wide open. Uh, playing ground for anybody who wants to get weird and start to experiment agree uh with that in mind let's call out a couple up objectives um how about you start us off here skylar yeah so uh one i like is thwarted destiny uh this is a surge hybrid score this immediately after an inspire step if you gave your warband's Bane of Heroes upgrade to an inspired fighter in that step, or the fighter that has your Warband's Bane of up, uh, Bane of Heroes upgrade was taken out of action in this turn. Um, so diving a little more into the Bane of Heroes, the fact that the fighter always has to be uninspired. If they are inspired, they're they're getting um, you know uh, brought down to that uninspired state. I think is really fascinating and. Uh, as somebody who really enjoys playing uh, Ideneth, uh, terrifying. <laughs> yeah, right. Be- because I really do not want to see this deck across the table from me if I'm playing either Ideneth Warband. Because if they're able to pass this over during um, you know my my time to shine, uh, they are reducing my like potential greatly for for that turn. So there's some fun counterplay specifically against Ideneth, just just baked into ba- Bane of Heroes here, um, but. You know, you're scoring this if you're taking an inspired fighter down to uninspired, and you're or you're scoring this if they take your Bane of Fearos upgraded fighter out, or you're taking theirs out, depending on which side of the field this parasite's currently yeah, on. Right. 
and so there's there's just a lot uh to this card i think it's it's going to be uh the number one surge in their deck you'll see this in in every one of their decks and um like when the parasite is on your fighter like will it uh ever invoke the feeling of like should i kill that fighter right now or could i accidentally be giving them seed glory you know like I, I think you still have to go for it and just kind of hope they don't have thwarted destiny in your hand in their hand. And if they do, like uh, you just kind of got to power through that uh, regardless. So you're, you're both getting a glory for that kill. Absolutely. Uh, the one that I'll call out is far and wide. So this is an end phase and it says if the fighter that has your warband's Bane of heroes upgrade is holding an objective uh, score one glory. If that objective is in enemy territory, gain an additional glory point. It's a very interesting card here in that it doesn't care if it's a friendly or an enemy fighter, but they do have to be holding an objective, so beasts won't ever score this. But they do have to have your Warband's Bane of Heroes upgrade. So in the mirror match, you do have to keep track of whose Bane of Heroes is whose. Uh, I just really like this because like, there's going to be times where you know you're playing an opponent who wants to hold ob- objectives and you're like, here, have the Bane of Heroes. And they'll just have to be like, can I afford to hold an objective with this fighter? Or am I just going to be handing uh, a glory or two to my opponent when I do this? Um, and I, Which I really love. And then, of course, if you have a good fighter for holding as well, uh, you can just be like, yep, I've got this fighter sitting on this objective with this Bane of Heroes. Like, you could choose to leave me alone, and I'll just sit here with this thing that's just sucking the life out of my fighter. But, you know, if you do, I'm probably going to score two glory off of this. So pick your poison, I guess. Um, some really fun, uh, some some sort of dilemmas you can put your opponents in with stuff like that. And I really enjoy that play space. Yeah. I love that. This uh, gives you that additional glory. If you've managed it on an enemy fighter, just <laughs> so rude. Yeah. Yeah. In enemy territory specifically. Uh, but, Oh, Oh my bad. Yeah. Uh, so you oh, do have control oh, right. of see. like, I see. Yeah. Uh, yep. Re- read the card. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In- but, improper. So it's like, Ooh, it's easier for your opponent to get you, but do they want to get you? Who knows? Uh, yep. but let's, let's move on. We've got a number of interesting gambits here. What, what direction do you want to go? There's, there's a whole bunch of cool oh my stuff. Gosh. Yeah. Like just like you're first acquainting yourself with void curse thralls, there's so much like interest to dive into here. And the card I'm going to pick is sudden swap, uh, choose two friendly fighters. If one chosen fighter has your war bands, Bane of heroes upgrade, you can remove each chosen fighter from the battlefield then place each fighter in the hex the other fighter occupied when you chose them. So uh, the reason I like this card so much is because I've messed around with unexpected arrival in the Malevolent Mass stack. So when I saw this one here, I wanted to call out the parallel because unexpected arrival requires both fighters to have a mast upgrade. Uh, and it's... Um, like it's interesting because the more masks you get out, uh, the more like your options at any given point in time, um, like uh, are available to you for you know for for unexpected arrival. But here, like there's Bane of Heroes is entering the game right away. Like unexpected arrival requires you to have like invested two glory generally at at some point in time to get those masks out. Here, your swap is fueled immediately just by the fact that um, you're playing Bane of you're playing this deck and Bane of Heroes will be there. Um, so at any point in time t- for you to be able to say that fighter there, uh, it can swap with any other one of my friendly fighters because that's the one with the parasite on it. I just think that this is going to, um, this is going to make games. This is oh, going to yeah. be a really good card. There, sh- there should be tons of really heady play with this card. Uh, totally agree. Very good choice. Um, I'm going to pick one that also has, I think, a lot of interesting implications and heady play and is called Tempting Lure. This is a reaction that you play after a fighter's move action. You then get to choose a friendly fighter. You can push the chosen fighter one hex closer to that fighter. 
if the fighter that made the move action has one or more Bane of Heroes upgrades, you can then push the chosen fighter up to three hexes closer instead. Uh, so <laughs> there, there's, there's a million different directions this can go. Um, but, but the, like the easiest thing would just be to say, oh, okay. I, you know, I, I move a friendly fighter. I pick a friendly fighter. I move, you know, the friendly fighter closer to the fighter, uh, that moved. If you can hand off the, uh, Bane of Heroes, uh, you can then have ways of pushing fighters like in for supports against your opponent opponent's fighters, Bane of Heroes, upgraded fighter, or uh, if you're moving your own Bane of Heroes, upgraded fighter, you can then like more quickly pull people along. Um, there's just a lot of different avenues for how to reposition fighters after a move with this. Um, and, and since it can be any fighter's move, like you can really use this when you need it and not um, specific to the Bane of Heroes part. So um, you you just have lots of flexibility. And I like uh, repositioning cards that have lots of flexibility. So Yeah, um, continuing on the parallels, this feels a lot like um, the refashioned reactions, refashioned priorities yeah. uh, space in, in Void Curse, right? Very much. And it's like a it's a card that has counter charge baked into it but isn't just counter charge and that was already a great card like back in the day when it, when it was around yeah yeah uh Very... it's situational uh, don't get me wrong uh but uh there's so much application here yeah i think i think if if like you should be able to find a use for this card if you can't find a use for this card i don't know what your deck is doing um, maybe if you're playing hold objectives or something like pushing towards a specific fighter is not always useful, but um, yeah, should be very good. There's lots you can do with that. That brings us to our upgrades. We are coming close to wrapping this up. Uh, there's a, a number of really cool ones. What is one that you would like to call out? Yeah, whew, this is uh, this is hard to pick one. So I'm just kind of throwing a dart here and grabbing stolen vigor. Sure. So as a reaction, use this after this fighter's second or subsequent activation in a phase. And I really like that caveat. Uh, remove one of this fighter's move tokens. If this fighter has one or more Bane of Hero upgrades, you can remove one of this fighter's charge tokens instead. If you do break this card. Yeah. So I think both of these abilities are like are extremely powerful and like have clear places where they're going to give great benefit. So I really like that it's locked behind a second activation with the fighter. Uh, I do think that this deck leans strongly uh, towards uh, big boys. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so too. I, I am a little scared to see some of these tools uh, come like come through on big boys, but and I'm getting ahead of myself there because that's something I wanted to talk about in summation with this deck. But like, I really like that. If that's the way players r choose to run this deck, well, then you're only ever getting that uninspired, you know, focus uh, a lot of the time, you know, from that fighter. Yeah. Uh, unless they're able to quickly get the the bane off and then get it back on when they need it. Uh, so, but here, uh, move tokens can be really punishing, right? So if you're up against like toxic terrors. Uh, or even uh, Force of Frost, and somebody's put a move token on you and are going to prevent you from being charged out, this card can just totally save that situation for you. Go ahead, activate that fighter. Uh, just go on guard, you know, or whatever it is that you can do with that fighter. Uh, but then, like, when you activate them again, you're going to be able to remove the move token from them. So you're going to need to use some of the tools in this deck because it is after um the second activation uh i think i'd like it a little more if the reaction was um like going into the second activation but um maybe 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 too strong but either way uh the fact that you can like shed a move token that's preventing the charged out status um or um you know get a whole super action fueled turn out of somebody who charged previously i think is, is yeah. really cool pretty good pretty good um there's some action economy stuff there that is 
pretty scary. Um, obviously, I think one thing that's worth calling out is fighters with ranged attacks. It, it gives them a much easier avenue into taking that additional activation without having racked up, you know, additional tokens. So you could like move, attack, remove your move, then charge. Uh, yeah. Pretty strong. So something to watch out for. I think it's a good card. Uh, since you mentioned some <laughs> inspire stuff, I'll I'll grab on this upgrade here. Uh, Divine Fortitude. So it says this fighter cannot be dealt damage by Bane of Heroes upgrade by a Bane of Heroes upgrade. So either players, which is interesting. Uh, but it also has this reaction that says, use this after you give this upgrade to a fighter that has one or more Bane of Heroes upgrades, which there will be a fighter with a Bane of Heroes upgrade at some point, and likely right away at the beginning of the game is when you would want to play this. You then break this fighter's Bane of Heroes upgrade, then inspire this fighter. Hey, Skylar, uh, are there any big boy fighters you wouldn't want to see get inspired after they get their first seed glory? uh all of them yeah right um yeah 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 so the interesting play here of course is that once you do play this out if you want to put the bane of heroes back on that fighter it would uninspire them again and they do not get to re uh get to react again because the reaction triggers from playing the upgrade but nonetheless even just a couple turns of like an early inspired kanan or an early inspired Molog is really terrifying so uh something to think about there and then even if you end up putting the bane of heroes back on them they at least won't take damage from it going forward so i think this card is definitely going to be in this deck all the time and i think there's going to be lots of really interesting applications because most of the time you can find a fighter where inspiring them is going to be a big stat boost yeah yeah, yeah. should be fun right <laughs> uh, you know uh, what I, i'm glad stolen vigor is uh not reacting into into the second activation i take yeah, it back yeah, yeah take it yeah. back absolutely yeah, yeah. i i was thinking about it when you're saying it i was like oh that'd be spicy <laughs> um but yeah so i i will say there is a lot more to dig into with this deck but we are going to leave it at that uh any parting thoughts for this deck before we close out this episode yeah, as I was seeing these two universal decks, uh, I could not help but uh, think of a comparison to Magic the Gathering. And so I thought it was super appropriate that it was the two of us on this uh, cast today because I feel and, and and I know you have a deeper knowledge of Magic the Gathering than I do. I feel we're getting a blue control deck in uh, the Hungering Parasite. And I feel like we're getting a red like chaotic <laughs> um, gambling deck. I can certainly in, uh, get uh, on the other. Yeah, I can certainly get on the red, the red chaotic deck train with you for sure. hundred percent. Oh, oh, but you'd say otherwise uh, here with uh hungry and parasite. Uh, uh, yeah, I would. I would. All right. Um, All right. Uh, I guess not, not in true, like denying, uh, and like uh, countering fashion, but man, just the fact that like, like uh, it was pitched as a control war band uh, in the preview by by John Bracken, and uh, yeah. the fact that you can move the hungering parasite to your opponent and like use that to your advantage and and control their play or score off their play uh, is so fascinating. Yeah. Oh, it it absolutely is. I think if you want to make a magic parallel, I'd say black control is probably closer to what you're getting here where you're not hard denying anything, but you're giving your opponent some really bad choices ooh, ooh. where it's like, oh, yeah. sure, you can have, you know, these benefits, but you're also going to have some pain to go along with it. And it's like, ugh, you know what to decide. <laughs> that's spot on. That, that's it. That, that must be why I'm drawn to it, too. Uh, yeah. That was that was my favorite type of uh, deck when I when I used to play that game. For so. sure. For sure. It should uh, be very fun. Very interesting deck. Yeah. Uh, overall, I, I'm really excited to see. I, I wish I wish I could say I was solely excited to see how this release box was going to shake the meta, but there's no telling. Yeah. Uh, so there's, the there's meta's... too many other things all at the same time. <laughs> the meta is about to be thrown into a box and then shaken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then the... we'll see what comes out. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
it, it's um, a wild time, but I, I think it'll be fun. I think we'll see a lot of different play styles just naturally because of all the new toys for people to play with. I think people will be like gravitating towards like, Hey, let's try out something new and see what sticks. And that's always a really fun time. Agree. Yeah. Uh, any, um, any highlights that you want to call out? I think, uh, the easy call outs for the two of us is that, um, you know, we're just really each independently excited for, for the new war bands. I think we kind of found some new projects in both of those. Um, yeah. Any, anything, anything else you want to highlight for um, us or, or, or for, you know, the, the broader audience that's uh, getting their hands on this box in a couple of weeks? I think that this is just going to be a really fun uh, toolbox to get to people for folks maybe who aren't brand new to the game, but for people who are uh, already well invested and, and want a bunch of new interesting things to add into their games. Uh I do wonder about some of like the difficulty level. Like there's certainly a learning curve with this box. Like nothing is straightforward in this Absolutely. box. Absolutely. Um, so I do think there's maybe some potential like problems for this being someone's entry point into the game, but it's not a lot more difficult than any of the other core boxes we've seen lately. So uh, yeah, I don't, I would I don't say- love that trend, but like, I understand it. The starter boxes kind of give people the easier in. Yeah, exactly. That's that's uh, what I wanted to kind of jump in with there is I think you raise a really good point on complexity in this box. I do think it's probably the most complex box we've ever received, uh, received uh, like yeah, holistically. Uh, and so I think, you know, buyer's guide for listeners out there, if you're looking to, you know, purchase a box to start somebody out with, I think... Uh, give yourself um, a couple of moments to think through, you know, how comfortable they are with uh, complexity in games. And if, you know, they rank pretty high for you, go for it. Um, but uh, if the answer, you know, to that is no or maybe, I think um, you, the starter boxes uh, are like going to be your best bet there. Like they're great entry points. Uh, and, and this one, I feel, you know, like has that complexity caveat. I think, you know, if you wanted to get them a, uh, ice themed box, uh, that has the same rule set, right? We don't actually have any rule changes here. Uh, go, uh, you know, go one back to death gorge, uh, and, uh, pick that up for them. Uh, if you're, if you don't want the starter box. So I, I think, uh, starter box or one back, um, and then this one uh, for, for the more uh, complex interest uh, out there. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Any last thoughts before we close it out here? Hmm. What are you going to hit me with from a flavor text quiz? Oh, that's, well, that's what I want to know. I, I got like a million choices here. I think... Uh, I think I'll just grab something from the uh, Skinnerkin because I know the deck best, <laughs> and uh, and I think some of the some of the man, I, like I said earlier, uh, some of it is just like just pure horror, but uh, it should be pretty good. Um, but before we get to that, we're gonna round things out here as always. Uh, if you'd like to let us know any sort of feedback or if you'd like to reach out to us with any sort of questions or anything else, you can get in touch with us at WTHCast or whatthehexcast at gmail.com. And as usual, thank you to GW for providing us a review copy of this early so that we can make this content possible. Um, and a big thanks to any of our patrons who are listening. Uh, your donations are very greatly appreciated and help us to keep these shows going, not just our shows, but the shows in the greater podcast network. Uh, super appreciated um, and uh, really appreciate like just super great that you feel the ability to be able to give us that little bit of help. Um, Speaking of the greater mortal realms network, if you'd like to check out any of the other content on that network, head on over to the mortal realms.com. We've got different shows for all the different 
AOS systems. We've got stuff for Warcry and for Age of Sigmar, and uh, you can go check all that out. They've got a bunch of new content coming sh- soon, I'm sure, because they've got a whole new edition of Age of Sigmar coming. Should be wild. Um, <clears throat> coming up for us next, we mentioned sort of at the beginning, we are almost certainly going to have an Adepticon recap if we can possibly sneak that in between all these new releases. And then uh, we would really love to get to some deeper dives on all this new stuff, either battle reports or deck building, um, just just a lot more uh, deeper stuff. And speaking of deck building, if you didn't know, Skylar has a YouTube channel, uh, What the Decks, and it is all about building a deck. Uh, just does a live build once a week. And so you should go check that out if you uh, are at all interested in seeing what the thought process is for building some decks. So, Skylar, how about a flavor text quiz for you? Let's go. Yeah. All right. Oh, man. There's so many to choose from. It's hard. It's really, my, really my hard. My wish to list here is that it has a translation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Well, I can I can certainly pick one that has a translation. Uh, oh, but then, then I have to pick a good one that has a translation. Mm, let's go with this one. Uh, Trikalk Kask Tagore, attributed to Grisla Tenderhook. Translation, I've never seen better meat, or I have seen better meat come out of a grot's nose. Fetch another. <laughs> <laughs> oh man um, is it oh back to the kitchens it, it is not uh i will okay. give you a first hint it is one okay. that we talked about in the episode uh it was Ooh. one of the call outs it was one of our call outs okay so then uh it's not he likes it fresh. Is it? Uh, no, I wouldn't say plated banquet. Ooh, I'm working through this. Not, <laughs> well, not, 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 not slaughterhouse. Uh, okay. Okay. Hold on. So we're, we're, we're into power. Um, what did we talk about in power? Uh, you're right. We're into let's power. See. Okay. I, I picked aspiring artisan. Uh, this is the most reverse engineering I've ever done to get to a quote. And that one I think was too wordy. I'm trying not to spoil anything for myself. I think that was too wordy to fit a quote on there. If I had to guess, so then, oh, what did you pick? Un, did you pick unfit for a king? Oh, it's unfit for uh, a you're king. You're right. Isn't it? It's unfit yeah. for a yeah. king. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, perfect. Yes. Very, very, very good there. And then, uh, all right. So to fi- finish things up here, uh, Davey had a recommended listening for us. And I felt like this, this was something that we need. From us straight out to GW, uh, recommended listening is Slow Down from Paul Cawthon. And <laughs> that'll do it for us today. For what the heck's, I've been Phil. I feel that one in my soul. I've been Skyler. Skyler.